Hi, this is Ed again on Global TV, coming to you from San Diego. And our very special guest today are Diane Ayers with Torchlight Rental. And she's been in uh, Canton, Ohio. And Jack Jample is with us again. And Jack, are you in the Jersey Shore or in someplace else today? Uh, yeah, I'm at my home outside of Philadelphia today. All right, great. Well, so, yeah. Thank you for being our guest on Global TV. So this is a uh, teleconference, not a webinar. So it's kind of free form, but we do have some uh, parameters. So Diane, I want to start with you, if it's okay. Um, porchlightrental.com. You just exclusively focus on rentals, and that's a that's a little unusual, isn't it? It seems it, we're very specialized in the market, and we only, like you said, serve renters. We don't have any other aspect of our business. We don't, you know, offer other services. We help people who are moving and who will be renting in their new location, whether that's a domestic move or international inbound. Whenever they're renting, that's what Porchlight helps with. Well, that's really good. So rentals, I think, are dominant now. And I guess they always have been. Uh, but the uh, the profitability from the relocation industry historically has been in the home buying and everything connected with that, of course. But the rentals are where the rubber meets the road, though. You're dealing with people's lives. Yeah. Well, we know historically over 50% of food would rent. And in today's world, and frankly, since 2008, We've really seen that number tick up to 60, 70 percent of those who are moving are choosing to rent. They may be home buyers eventually. They may be home buyers within six months. They may not buy a home at all and keep the home back in the origination city. The reality is we have a demographic mix right now over four generations. And those people are all making choices to rent, not out of necessity. Again, it's a choice that they want to lease initially. And they need quality service around that. And that's what we do. Okay. So we're going to get back to you in just a minute. Now let's reintroduce Jack Jemple from Stryker, Senior Manager of mm -hmm. Global Mobility. Welcome again. Uh, how's Thank your you. summer going? Is it, does, uh, are, are there relocations for Stryker? Yeah. Um, we're definitely down on uh, on the volume on our relocation, just like many other companies. Um, we are starting to pick up now that uh, they are having. Uh, surgery starting up, um, you know, because hospitals now have separate areas. So it does help our business uh, as far as voluntary type of uh, surgeries and things of that nature. So we're starting to pick up a little bit. Yeah, yeah that's good. So, Jack, um, you made a decision a long time ago to get into this aspect of uh, rental assistance as a, as, a, as a benefit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting where it started out was I'm on the um, advisory council for an RMC, their supplier advisory council. And Diane was uh, on the board of that meeting and everyone went around talked about their businesses and you had your lenders and your, uh, you know, realtors and all the normal type of uh, household good movers. And Diane spoke about her company and it really just kind of clicked at that point that there's a big opportunity here that we're missing. Uh, as she was saying, there's a lot of renters out there and employee experience has always been my number one. So that's where I first saw, uh, you know, this opportunity. Oh, Diane, this is a, a beautiful thing for your business, of course. Why don't you talk a little bit about these awards that you've won and the recognition by Triple and others uh, about providing this uh, extensive service. It's just not quickie. It's like you stick with these people and help them, right? You, right. Um, back in 2012, I contacted Alan Triple because I was aware of his survey and all the categories that he surveys in. And the relocation managers, of course, complete the survey. And I called him and I said, you know, Alan, I'm not seeing if there's a category related to rental and destination services. Is there a reason for that? Is it not a priority? You know, I just wanted to understand why that was not evaluated. He wasn't aware that the category existed, literally. And so 
we went to the relocation managers and asked them, you know, is this of interest to you? Would you like to have some data around this? And they came back and said yes, apparently. And then we added the category. So from that point forward, the, the category was then sent to the relocation managers in their surveys. And ever since that happened, Porchlight has been the top performing company from a, a relocation manager perspective. Then a couple of years ago, he started a survey to renters specifically, to transferees and broken out by renter. And in that case, Porchlight again, topped the survey results. So we kind of fly under the radar a little bit in that we're not global. So I think sometimes that the attention around that is a bit diminished, but we serve North America, which is no small territory. <laughs> and we serve every city across the US and Canada. And because this is our specialty and our focus, I really feel like this just stands out. It's what we do really well. And the surveys, I think, are reflecting that really well. Okay. So, Jack, do you have to go through hoops to change policies to accommodate this? Yeah, you know what? It was actually pretty easy because we've always had renter policies. We've always had support for renters, but it was always through the RMC. And, and the RMC has the same old model that they've always had by using realtors to help find renters. And it always gets back to the home sale and the home purchase uh, of what's driving it. And so all we had to do was have the RFC start using Porchlight for our rental assistants, who has the core competencies for what we're looking for. And you know, we found that they were finding places a lot quicker. They had systems in place. They were, you know, specifically looking at our renters. And it, it's a tool out there that I think RMCs are just not, you know, they just don't want to make changes in our industry. And it's very hard to get those changes because we still have that home sale and home purchase mentality when 70% of our movers are renters. Well, I would think you're in the driver's seat on this. Talk more about what your demands as, as uh, the boss, uh, what are your demands to get to the big X, the employee yeah. experience. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things I've I've been an employee experience. I've been saying this for ten years now that if you get that right, the rest of your issues and problems, most of them go away. So uh, I saw that as an opportunity that we were just missing with the renters. And what you know, Porchlight brings is that centralization of reporting and of data and of cost. Whereas in the past. You know, it was hard to determine what kind of service we were getting provided. We didn't really have, uh, we tried not to survey individuals too many times. So now Porchlight is able to do that for us and provides, you know, on a monthly basis, what the data looks like and to see how well or if we need to make changes in the program. So I, I think from uh, an RMC perspective, I think it's not in just in renters. I think it has to go with household goods. They just have to get more specific on who they're using to support them so that you can get a better picture of how that service is working for your company. Okay, so um, Diane, from your research and customer files, uh, you have analytics. In other words, documentation. Right. Yeah, would you talk about that? I will. Um, and Jack alluded to it. What Porchlight started our, our business based on were three service pillars, and those have not changed today. They are still unique in the marketplace, and they separate us from our competition. The one being we do serve all across North America, any type of rental, apartment, single family home, condo, any family dynamic, pets, credit issues, whatever the, the situation. Clients can count on us for that. Clients can also count on us to know that we'll support the renter until they have an address. So regardless of policy, whether it's $1,000 for a renter or a full day tour, beyond that service, once it's officially completed, if somebody doesn't have an address, the service isn't complete for Porchlight. So we have systems and mechanisms in place within our organization to support that transferee until they have an address. And that brings me to the analytics, because within that portal, 
our clients can see the transferees who actually secured a rental as a result of the service. And in our mind, when we started this business, to charge a service fee, it, for us, it was always more than a survey result. It was always about if Jack orders or authorizes a rental finding experience for his employees, at what point does he want to understand how many employees are actually finding a rental as a result of that money that's being spent? So for us, it was always about an ROI to the corporation to be able to assess their program and say, you know what, this supplier is actually driving success. They are actually creating an outcome of an address, which is really what people are hoping for when they organize a rental finding service. Yes, you wanna have the area insights and some local area exploration and understand your new area, but ideally you want them to actually find that home and that lifestyle match that makes sense because that's the full experience for an employee that's relocating. They may love Stryker and the employer that they're working with, but if they choose a miserable place to live because they were rushed or didn't really fully know what they were doing, it really impedes that experience long-term. So our job is to make sure all facets work. We'll help them find the right lifestyle match and the employer will do their part and together you have a happy relocation. But those renter analytics are available to our clients to log in 24 seven and see the outcome of our service. How do they use the service, survey results, it's all there. Okay, and I gotta zoom in on um, COVID and this issue of trust, clean and safe. You're going into uh, someone else's place, you know, so how can you certify that the properties will uh, will not harm a renter? Well, today, a lot of this is done virtually, but I'm happy to say really from July forward, much of it can also be done in person again. And it's just as if you were entering anyone's home or if you were looking at a rental, people have their masks on, you have some social distancing, you now make sure that you give people notice before they come into a rental. You know, we always had to give 24 hours notice, but if there are people living there, those people will be exiting and nobody is allowed to touch anything. So in order to just keep it as sanitary as possible, you still have to be able to see homes. I mean, people are buying homes today, walking through homes. It's no different than renting a home or apartment communities that are allowing you to walk through their properties, you're masked, things are either done on Zoom or if they're done in person, you're really just keeping that social distance and you're not touching things. Yeah, so so Jack, obviously this is cool for you. So, uh, be, because there's a safety and uh, a teamwork approach and you don't have to worry about this because you have a trustworthy source. So, so Jack, how do you, um, deal with the RMCs. I mean, you're the boss, I know this, but uh, but how do you deal with the RMCs that uh, are not making money because people are renting? Well, I'm, you know, this gets back to something that I've said over and over again, is that the model has to change. The pricing model for RMCs has to change. Yep. Um, I mean, we, we have this pricing model that to look like uh, we pay nothing. You know, it's a free service to RMCs. And until that changes and until, you know, it continues to be referrals is their main, uh, you know, profit, it's going to be very difficult for them because there's going to be more and more of this where corporations are starting to see better solutions that we want the RMC to manage. Um, I think they need to get back to a per file fee. Uh, is, is really the answer to this, and it's for household goods as well as for the renter assistance. And I'm sure there's a referral fee that they're paying now, that Diane is paying now. I mean, obviously it's confidential, but I'm sure there's a referral fee for that as well. But I just see a major rehaul of, of the RMC pricing model has to occur. So, Jack, I don't want to put you on the spot at all, but um, <laughs> are you saying that? You you as a corporate uh, customer, a buyer, would be willing to pay a fee to the RMC in, in lieu of, uh, you know, in order to have more control over all this? Look, I can, I now, in theory, if, if that was to happen, then in theory, the pricing from your various 
um, suppliers like Diane and Household Good Movers should in theory come down because they're not paying a referral. So it's a matter of showing the numbers to a corporate person that says, look, you know, this is what it used to cost. This is what it's going to cost you. And at the end of the day, it should be about the same. Um, you know, I don't know that for sure, but there has to be some give because now you're not paying a referral fee. All the temp uh, housing places that pay referral fees and that all goes away uh, under the new pricing model. So it's just a matter of how you show the numbers. Uh, I know I know. you once told me that your background is running a business. And so you're bringing that obvious experience and insight mm -hmm. to the relocation industry. And, mm -hmm. and I dare say that uh, many of your counterparts in different companies, and of course, it's a big universe out there, do not have business experience. Yeah, I mean, I was with a pharmaceutical company you know, for 20 over 20 years and had some major HR positions in the business and finance. So I'm looking at it from different perspectives and not just from the mobility perspective, understanding what the business needs are and, and taking it from that approach. And, you know, a lot of times where the corporate thinks is that by doing these things I'm talking about, it's going to create more work for me, but it doesn't create more work for you. It actually is less work because I know Diane, has a company that's their core competency. And I don't have to worry about what realtor is showing you know, people uh, rentals that really their ultimate goal is for them to buy a house from them. Yeah. So it's not more work. I, I think it's less work and it's more productive. So Diane, let's get into the special sauce for Porsche Life. Okay. Uh, is it um, got jalapeno in it? Uh, what kind of sauce is it? <laughs> it is. I can't, this is being recorded, so I can't tell you, but our, <laughs> our special sauce, honestly, is the continued support. And I've been told time and time again from my, my customers, when they know about that, they just can't believe that it happens and that everyone doesn't know about it. And so the best way for me to make sure everyone knows about it is to do things like this. So COVID for me has been helpful because there are these kinds of programming opportunities going on and the ability to forward information to customers differently. But when you have somebody that's moving, whether they're buying or renting, you need them to have a home. And at some point, that that renter has to have an elevated experience because they are no different than the person in the same position that is buying a home. Yet the home buyer can be treated with so much more attention. And I grant you, they're making a bigger investment. So, you know, if they make a mistake, it's a bigger mistake than if you rent and have to move a year or two later. But I would, you know, ask you to have a show and ask people how much they love moving. <laughs> it is not a, a favorite thing for people. So if they actually can get into a lease and stay for a couple of years, that's a much better situation. And people today are not, you know, just 18 to 24 year olds renting. For 10 years now, people have been 30, five, 45, 55, they have children and families. They don't want to be moving a lot. They want to stick with the school system and help their children have some normalcy through that process. And so, you know, our job is to just make sure that that happens at a, at a higher level with really quality support. That's what we do every day for the renters. I feel like I am the advocate for renters. So that's going to be my, my new line. And, so, and you know, and you know, I just want to add to that is that uh, RMCs are missing out on a differentiator here. And I, and I keep trying to, I, I know a lot of RMCs and say, you know what, when you do an RFP, if you can come in and say you have a true rental program, you know, say with Porchlight, it's a differentiator. And RMCs are still afraid to make that change because they think they're going to lose revenue. But at the end of the day, they can gain, you know, that one plus that they're missing. I, I want to ask a question to Jack. I'm just curious, Jack. I have conversations with some of my RMC customers from time to time when they're doing RFPs and so on and so forth, and they'll ask me for some input on things. My belief is if I was a salesperson prospecting, my, my approach would be to talk about renters first because I believe nobody else is probably doing that. They are going to go after the revenue source and the income source, and I understand it from a business perspective, but the reality is 50% or better are going to be renting and their competition isn't walking in the door talking about renters. And I believe that's, 
therein lies a differentiator for all the RMCs. Yeah, absolutely. And what's happening is, is that because it's all revenue driven still in the RMC's minds, instead of looking at the big picture and saying, I'm trying to get this company as a whole for their business. So if they have 60% renters, why am I not concentrating more on that piece of it? Because that's what the business is going to look at. Exactly. So Diane, with, um, the impact of uh, in large cities like New York, for instance, and, and other cities, uh, people are moving out. They're, uh, they're, they want a house and they're renting or those who can are buying. But most people uh, are going to rent. So you, you have an enviable position here uh, as a result of all this, helping people negotiate better to find rental housing, perhaps with a backyard that they never had sure. uh, or a granny flat and over the garage. <laughs> um, so because people need more space. They do. And and today, even or previous years, over 50 percent of who we moved moved with pets and many of them dogs. So even, you know, having dogs in an apartment or a more confined space, I'm sure is challenging. But people are looking to move out of the cities for lots of reasons, but they're getting out of their more expensive leases and either going back home or somewhere else because they can work remotely at least for six months to a year. So it's allowing people to get out of this expensive environment they've been in. There was just an article that came out about Boston the other day and how the rent, they're giving things away in Boston and where everything was broker fee because landlords wouldn't pay agents for that. Now they're saying, you know, we'll pay the broker fee. They're, they're making so many changes because they're seeing that occupancy rate drop and new apartment construction is at an all-time low in the last five-year low. So you're seeing that transition happen. People are able to get out of these expensive cities, take a reprieve, at least for now, while they're remote working. And then they may re-enter again if they have to go into that office location because it's always been about location, location, location. They, people don't want to more than a 30-minute commute most often. Some people want to walk. So it will come back if they're required to go into their office. But if they're not, then they're going to make other lifestyle choices. Yeah. So <laughs> the the impact of COVID, Jack, on employees, uh, particularly young people's, call it Gen Z, in other words, uh, early 20s, um, they are very, very tech-oriented and very untrustworthy. <laughs> I'm not trustworthy, but wary of uh, older people um, not delivering on what they say they're going to do. Have you noticed that in the workforce? Well, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, you talk about remote work and there's one side of it that says everyone's going to start working from home and that's going to be the new norm. But you know what? At the end of the day, if anyone wants to get ahead, they have to be in the office rubbing shoulders with the right people. OK, it's very hard to get ahead working from home. Now, I'm not talking about the older people. I'm talking about exactly what you're talking about. It, you know, those people that are hungry that want to get ahead. OK, at some point have to get to the office. They have, to, you know, and maybe it's not five days a week, but they'll have to relocate. OK, maybe it's three days a week in the office and two days from home. But, you know, for anyone to get ahead. I, I have a hard time believing that a uh, virtual setting is going to be able, you're going to be able to do that successfully. Okay. So Diane, in summary, as we come to a close here, uh, I want to thank you for organizing this. This has really been uh, educational and uh, easy. I thank you, Jack, again, for doing this and uh, I invite you to come back. Uh, so, Diane, do you want to sum up and talk about what it looks like for the fall season? We're seeing some um, plateauing as we go from July to August. We saw a little bump in those two months. June was the strongest, and I think the industry in general is indicating that. May and June started to come out with some better numbers. July kind of curtailed. August is up a little bit. We're hoping that continues for a couple of months. And then personally at Porchlight, we have had some new RFP wins. So we do hope that that is a really nice fourth quarter opportunity for us. But just longer term and what I'm hearing on different webinars I attend, reading any economic outlooks, 
we're really looking at 2021, probably second quarter to see a little uptick. But generally speaking, 20 to 30% business reduction um, to 2019 numbers is kind of the forecast I'm hearing out there for 2021. And then by 2022, seeing some um, return to a 2019 normalcy. That, that's the, the last that's out there. What do you call it? Crystal ball that's out there right now. Yeah, right. So, Jack, what about yourself? What do you see for the fall? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, we're, we're starting to pick up activity, um, you know, with more of the critical hours. I, you know, just from my own opinion, probably the beginning of 2021, and as we continue to move ahead, we'll um, obviously increase in our activity. Um, it may take probably maybe over a year to get back to where we were uh, as far as relocation activity, but I think eventually, uh, we will get back to a very close norm, uh, you know, just from my own opinion on what's going on. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for being our guest again on Global TV. And uh, we'll talk soon. We'll see you on the trail. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Okay. This is Ed signing off from San Diego. That's Jack outside Philadelphia and Diane in Canton, Ohio. <laughs>